Hallelujah, hallelujah. This is a bread of power. You are welcome to this great session of the Bread of Power, an online fellowship of the Jesus Power Outreach Ministries. This is where the glory of God settles and the power of God is revealed. This is a place where God encounters his people in a special way. You are welcome for another great session. Today we are going to get into the mysteries of God, mysteries of God's kingdom. Today God's eyes, God will open your eyes to deep things in his kingdom and God will strengthen your faith. Today I want to encourage you, call your friends, call your family, stay around with your family. This is a season when we need to come closer to God because the things that God is unraveling in our season is very deep and uh, I know that God will take us from glory to glory as we persevere in his presence. Now we want to get into our worship as we call upon our minister of worship, our dear brother, Oludere Lijoka, to take us into God's presence. Let's worship God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Glory to God. Hmm. Invisible, yet tangible, childlike and simple, limitless, heaven thinks like this, oh this is the kingdom realm, and I feel heaven I can hear you calling Come up here The door is standing open Come up here Just let go of all the way When you're up here There's no chaos or confusion It is clear Come on. Do 
Just let go of all the weight when you're up here There's no chaos or confusion, it is clear So come back Hallelujah. 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 Come up here. Come up here. The door is standing open. Come up here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord is calling us to come up to the ring where he is. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. What an awesome worship. Today we're going straight into the word of God. And today's theme is come up here. And we're taking our study from the book of Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. And I read, And after these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Immediately, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper, and sat his stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And the thrones proceeded, and from the thrones proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal, and, the, and in the midst of the throne, and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, and full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Hallelujah. 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 This is a prayer and call from the Lord Jesus to all his saints who are waiting for his return. The time is crucial. The end is close. The stakes are high. The pressures from the kingdom of darkness is much. But the determination of God to separate the bride, the bride of Christ from the world is strong. And in that bid, the Lord is calling his bride to come to the realm where he is. Come up here. Come to, to the realm where I am. For that's where you belong. God is calling us to be separated from the world. Our world is soaked in so much darkness and corruption. First John chapter 5 verse 19 says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We see the things that are in our world today. So, so much wars and bloodshed. So much injustice and wickedness. So much immorality and perversion. So much terrorism and violent crimes. So much deception and dishonesty. So much witchcraft and occultism. So much misfortune and disasters. But the Lord has called us to be the light of the world. We are not to live under the burden of this evil and wickedness. God is calling us to the realm where He, the realm where He is. We are redeemed to be the eagles of God in our world, 
stars, places in the sky, in the realm, in the heavenly realms where God is, with Christ, with his angels. We should stop living like chickens in our world, struggling for, for survival in the dust beings of sin, afflictions, oppression, causes, and bondages. We should come up like the eagle, soar to this place of glory where God is. God is speaking to his people to fall into alignment with him. Many of us are out of alignment because of sin, because of compromise. But the Lord is speaking to us. Let's know where we belong. We belong with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. If then you be raised with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on the things on the earth. For you are, you've died. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. God is calling us to come out of the place of weakness come out of the place of rising and falling, come out of the life of compromise, life of, life of complacency. You belong to the sky. It goes down pick around in the dustbins. The Lord is saying, I dwell in the place of glory. I dwell in the place of holiness, the realm of holiness, the realm of power, the realm of solutions, the, the realm of miracles, signs and wonders, where you belong as a child of God. Not in the realm of fear and anxiety, not in the realm of doubts and failures, disappointment and setback, bondages and curses. No. If you come to the place of power and victory, the place of anointing and glory, that's where the Lord is. And that's where you should be as a child of God. The problem we have with the church is that we've settled with the basics. And there are no drives for greater things in God, in us. There's no hunger for revival. We should all understand that our born again experience is the open door to the treasures of God. You should not just stay at the door. You should walk into the kingdom and explore the riches and the glories that is in God's kingdom. Look into the beauty of his holiness. Bask in the glories of his presence and enjoy his goodness, his love, and his power. The problem we have today in the body of Christ was not a problem that the Hebrew Christians had. When Paul spoke to them in Hebrews chapter 5, Paul said in verse 12, he said, by this time when you to be teachers, you still have need for someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You are still talking of milk where you should be, having solid food. You are not skilled in the works of righteousness. You are still babies in the faith. You need to grow up. Be warriors. Especially in our sin-laden and turbulent world, you should be warriors for God. The love of baseline Christianity. Get deeper. Grow up. Be warriors. Be champions of faith. Go for exploits. This you should be your identity. As a believer, your trademark should be as the word of God brings out in Mark chapter 16, verse 17. He said, This sign shall follow those who believe. It should be your trademark. Exploits, breakthroughs, testimonies, joy, peace, unspeakable. That's where you belong as a child of God. The problem we have today. In the body of Christ, and like the problems they had in the first century church. The first century church 
was better with so much persecution. The believers went around, traveled around, and preached the gospel so vehemently. Vehemently. They walked in holiness. They were separated from the world. They withstood a lot of oppositions to the faith. They started few, but soon they began to grow until they grew and became a great force to reckon with in Asia Minor and in the Middle East, they became so strong. The Bible tells us in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, verse 20, the point of their victory was revealed. But the scripture says, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. At the end of the first century, there were no longer few. There were now many. Christianity had become a recognized religion. But what happened was that the church plateaued. The believers settled. They stopped digging deeper for deeper things in God. They settled at the elementary doctrines. And many of false doctrines began to brew among them. Some of them turned into things that looked like social movements, like clubs, like political groupings. They had camps. Some were followers of great heroes. Some were of Paul, some were of Apollos. Many of those things began to appear. And the commitment to Christ waned. The Lord is speaking to us that there is a danger, that's a danger signal. The second of danger signal that came to the Testament church, the Old Testament church, the church that was called out of Egypt, the church of the Israelites, who received the promise of God, uh, of God in Egypt to enter into the promised land. They left Egypt with power. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. God took them to the wilderness. But you know what? How many of them made it at the end into the promised land? There were only two adults, only Joshua and Caleb. Out of millions that God had promised, only two made it to the end. And the same challenge came for the first century church. They were very exuberant in their faith. Many suffered a lot. A lot of prizes were paid. A lot were muttered. But God, as they began to grow, they began to lost, lost, lose their strength. And the drive in their faith began to wane. But the Lord began to speak to them. Because the enemy was behind, walking against them. The kingdom of darkness was walking against them. Their strength began to wane. And the, bus, the, the, the Lord began to warn them that if they don't take time, the current of the opposition of the kingdom of darkness will sweep them away. And that was the danger that they faced. It's close to the kind of danger we face in our world today. The charge towards the end of the first century had become established. Rather than rising higher and getting deeper with God, they have plateaued, they have watered down their standards, some have mixed their faith with worldly ideas and philosophies. Many became complacent and worldly. Many of them began to live as if nothing, not much was at stake. Rather than pursuing greatly the heavenly treasures, they began to pursue worldly glories. They lost their passion for God and their focus for heaven. And Apostle John, he lived through all the generations. Indeed, Apostle John was such a special apostle. He lived through all the eras. 
He was one of the first disciples to be saved and to follow Jesus. He ended up being one of the 12 to be called out as one of the 12 apostles. After the 12 apostles, he was one of the three closest the apostles of the inner circle. And even among those apostles of the inner circle, he was the one that was most beloved to the Lord. Because the Bible said that he was the one that was close with him at meal and leaned on the bosom of the Lord. That was the one that was called John the Beloved. He was so close with Christ. Even when Jesus was transfigured, he was one of those that was on the mountain with Christ. He saw all the miracles. He was he lived a life of intimacy and lived with the Lord. So he was one that one could say knew the Lord. He saw the Lord where he was on the cross. He saw Jesus die on the cross. So he was one of the oldest apostles. And out of all the apostles, the apostles, the other apostles, they were all martyred. But John the Beloved was the only apostle that lived his entire life. And at his old age, where he could have been about 120 years, he was pitched to an island, the island of Patmos. There he was when Christ appeared to him. But when he saw Jesus glorified, he saw Jesus on the cross, he saw that, oh, that was different from the one that he has always known. It wasn't the Jesus that was in a manger, the little baby, no. The glorified Christ is not just a little baby in a manger. He wasn't so just the one that walked across Galilee. He wasn't just the one that was crucified, who died in weakness. And what he saw was even beyond what Christ was when he rose from the grave. When he saw the glorified Jesus, as revealed in the book of Revelation 1 from verse 12 to 17, the Bible said that his hair and his hair were white as wool. As the ancient of days, his eyes were like flame of fire, penetrating every heart, bones and marrow, unraveling every mystery. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in brazen furnace, like a warrior ready for war. His voice thundered like a monstrous storm of mighty ocean waves. He held Seven stars in his right hand. And sharp two edged sword came out of his mouth. His face shined like the sun in his greatest strength. When John saw this, he was overwhelmed that he collapsed. The overwhelming splendor of the glorified Jesus came on him so powerfully. That he could not stand. He fell like dead. But there the Lord woke him up. It was like telling him that this is not the time to collapse. This is not the time to fall down like dead. Because there's a problem to sort out. He gave him a message. Go back to the church. And warn the church in Asia Minor. Because... The life of the church was so vulnerable to the invasion of the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of darkness was coming with a great storm against the church. But the church was so complacent, so worldly. The message that came from Christ to the seven churches in Asia Minor, these were of the Roman Empire that is called the nation of Turkey today. Those seven churches represented the body of Christ at that time. The image of their life 
show the picture of the church. The problem that stood before John the beloved in that revelation was that the great gifts of the excellency of the glorified Christ was so different from the picture that he saw of the body, the body of Christ, the church, the churches that were existing at that time. The head, Christ, was so full of splendor, but the body was soaked in corruption, in compromise, in weakness, and in, in imperfection. It was as if the body could not match the head. There was no pursuit for excellence. There was no drive for glory, for beauty. The warning was coming. That's a great danger. Because the torrent of the wave of the powers of this world will swoop the body away if it cannot stand up to match up with the glory of the head, which is Christ. The revelation, the book of Revelation was given to a church that was complacent and not pressing for the greater things in God. A church that had plateaued, had not much at stake, a church that had become liberal and self-contented, felt so close to the world and chose a church that was that felt so big that they had to they, they chose what to believe and what not to believe, what to pursue and not to pursue, what not to pursue. God was not uh, Christ was no more the ultimate, and that was the danger that was before the church. The church had become so weak, and the warning was coming from the master that. The powers of this world will sweep them away. The church had lost its vision. They were minoring in the major and majoring in the minor. None of them were living in safe. The great things of the kingdom of God was still at stake for them. The churches were the churches. The first was the church in Ephesus. That was the backsliding church. The church that has lost his first love, where Christ was no, did not more have the first place in their hearts. And the Lord warned them that if they do not come back to their old love, he will extinguish their light. The second church was the church in Smyrna, the weak and the poor church. The church that was already under a lot of persecution whose strength was in their weakness and whose beauty was in their poverty. And the third was the church in Pergamos. The church in Pergamos was a compromising church. The church that was dwelling where Satan was enthroned. A liberal and indulgent church. A church that adopted a weak version of Christianity, mixed Christianity with idolatry. They held the doctrines of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, with a lot of immorality, a lot of fornication. And they think that you could carry all of them along. You could do a lot of a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of paganism, and you can still go along with God. But God warned them that He hates this. And if they don't repent, then God Himself will come to fight them. Then also the church, the fourth was the church in Titara. The church in Titara. The corrupt and immoral church. The church where Jezebel has been enthroned. Enthroned to minister. And her children has also ministered with Jezebel. The pandemic, seduction and immorality. Witchcraft in the church. And God said that he's going to come with judgment. And he's going to slay. He's going to destroy Jezebel and slay her children. 
Then also the message came to the church in Sardis. The church that is life, in a life, but is really dead. They have a name to be alive, but is dead, spiritually bankrupt. And the Lord warned them. And then also, the Lord went sent the message to the church in Philadelphia. The church that had an open door had great potentials. But they had little strength. They had little capacity. Great opportunities. But little capacity to carry it. And God was sending a warning to them. And it's not enough. The church of the Lord must go for excellence. The beauty of holiness must be seen in the church. The heavenly pursuit must be optimum. The glory of God and the visions of God must be sharpened and strengthened in the church. Finally, also, they had the lukewarm church, the church in Laodicea. The church that was filled with a lot of treasures, but they are empty of heavenly treasure. A church that in which it, it, seemed, it seemed there was nothing at stake. But the Lord is saying, was saying that he is standing at the door, knocking. If anyone who hear his voice and open the door, he will come in, he will die with him, and those will also die with him, with the Lord. The danger that the church was facing at that time was that the body did not feed the head. And the current of the storm of the world was about to sweep away the church because of their crumbled fate. And the warning from the Lord is that they not need to stand and overcome. The he that overcomes will be rewarded. We wear the crown of glory. But he that is defeated will be swept away by the torrent. And you know, the warning came to that church. And in the end, that warning caught up with them. Because what remained in the church many years after were ruins. Because they could not heed the warnings of the Lord. And the same warning is coming to us in our generation. The same warning is coming to us because our world, the body in our world today, the body of Christ is turning more worldly. The, world, the, the church is turning more worldly. Meanwhile, the, the world is looking more churchy. There's a lot of mixture. There's a lot of compromises. There's a lot of compro uh, uh, complacency. Many are losing focus of heaven. Many are seeking for earthly glories. Earthly college. But the heavenly treasures are winning. And God is warning us. Now what in our world today we are seeing a lot of calamities. These are signs of the end time. And they are beginning of sorrows. But worse things are still coming. The wars, the terrorism we are seeing today, the heinous crimes we are seeing today, the hate, the discrimination, racism, corruption, wickedness. These are all signs of the end time. But the warning is still being given to us. This is a time for us to stand in the faith. It's time for us to battle against the kingdoms of darkness. This is a war time. Because in our time, the enemy is releasing the worst spirits. And worst things are still thin. When God, the Lord called John here, and his eyes were opened, John began to see greater things about the kingdom of God where we are going to. He saw the glories of heaven. He saw the majesty of the Almighty God and of the, of the Lamb of God. He saw that many things that are still coming ahead, the judgment that are still coming. He saw the ultimate power of Satan that's still coming and the judgment against those powers of darkness. You know, some of us are having great challenges facing the storms in our time. But the storms are still ahead. 
The book of Revelation tells us that more wicked demons are still held, held back, and will still be released in the end time. More forces of darkness are still going to come. More pains and, and sufferings will still come in. More turbulence and troubles, more persecution. The greater tribulation is still ahead. Now, if we cannot stand the pressures of our time, so when wicked, more wicked demons are released, how can we stand? The Lord is telling us that this life of sin and compromise that we are living today is a time bomb. Life of immortality and complacency in the church is a time bomb that could get the church in the way. The Bible says when Christ will come, will he find faith on the earth? That's the challenge today. The Lord says that we should look up. Look up to the finish of our faith. Look, because in John saw in the book of Revelation, he saw, he saw Satan. He also saw the end of evil. He saw the judgments, the seven seals, and the seven trumpets, which are the judgments still coming ahead. The judgment that's going to come against Satan, against the kingdom of darkness. You know. Evil will still end. Kindness we see in our world today is unpaid. Sins. The comfort of the sins. When the parts of darkness will rise, they will also end. The part of the revelation that John saw in the book of Revelation where the power of God, the ultimate power of God, is still going to be revealed. The glories of heaven. The beauties of heaven, the majesty of God, but the ultimate reward of the saints is still ahead. The marriage supper is still coming. The comfort of the saints, the healing and restoration that will come for all the saints through all the years of troubles and turbulence. The reign of Christ, the, ten, the thousand year of uh, ten, the, the, the millennial reign of Christ. Those are still ahead. But those are the things that should give me sense to be strong, to not relent, to pursue heaven with all that you've got. Because the treasures ahead is far greater than whatever you can expend on earth. It's what God is calling us out today. The Old Testament church failed. It's only two that made it. The First Testament church failed also. And uh, their churches turned into ruins. Many of them were swept away by the Islamic insurgents that came at the end of the first century. Swept away and preached in many of those places that in this region today, you don't have living churches that are standing. But the challenge is to the church today, the end time church. Shall we stand the storms in our time? Shall we stand the storms of temptations that are in our time? When you see all the social media, you see the, 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 the television, the radio, in all the medias, the things that are being broadcast, the evil, the wickedness, the laws that are being made in, in nations. Many are working against the kingdom of God. We won't be able to stand, worship God faithfully in the midst of a stormy world, in the midst of a corrupt world. The challenge is out there for us. God is saying we should stop living a fake life. It's time we begin to live a committed life, a true committed life with Christ. It's time to put behind those things that are past and pursue the great things of the kingdom of God. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 to 14. Behold, I count not, I count not myself to have apprehended. May this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press towards the mark for the price of the high calling in Christ Jesus. The Lord is saying, come up here. Press towards the mark. A love of lukewarm Christianity, a love of compromising, 
a love of living a life of substandard Christianity. It's time to pursue the greater things in God. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. He said, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When is who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake, the wrath of God, comment on the children of disobedience. God is calling us to a life of holiness. There are no reasons for compromises and sin in our lives. The Lord is saying, come up here. Come up to the realm where I belong. It's where the glorified master is. He is the head. If we are truly the body of Christ. If we are truly the body of Christ and be united, united with Christ in rapture, we have to come to the place of holiness. We have to completely abdicate with sin. Yes, it goes on. They said Colossians 3 from verse 12 to 15. He said, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also must you. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. And that's what God is talking, telling us, uh, talking to us about. It's time to rise up and soar like the ego. A love of struggling Christianity, struggling on the baseline, just like chickens. Rise up, come up here. Let's look like ego. Put to where God is. Put on the whole armor of God. Fight against the kingdom of darkness. Resist the devil and he will flee. The Lord is calling us to conform to this world, may be transformed to the renewal of our mind. But we'll be able to prove what is that perfect. That fit an acceptable will of God. Surrender all to God. Trust in Him. Live by faith. The grace of God is able to carry you when you walk by faith and live in the promise of God. Stand up against sin. Resist Satan's kingdom. When you will see the power of God in your life, provide his presence, rest in his love. It's where you belong. You are an ego. The egos belong in the sky. And that's what God is saying. Everything, everything, every area of your life, you need to walk towards that towards that perfection that God has called us on, out, out to. And that's the turn of God for us. And that's my prayer for you. That Lord Almighty, I pray for your children. So we visit your children in your power. Visit your children in your glory. Break yokes from their lives, Father. And I prophesy to every soul under my voice. That oh God, that we hear your voice on the valley value of sin, value of bondage, value of fear and anxiety. Right is to the place of glory, to the place of power, to the place of strength. For the vast of bondage, of curses and yokes. Yes, for the place of consistency, oneness, the place of prayer. I release the spirit of revival upon your children for exploits in, in this end time. To so bring souls to the kingdom of God. To so live a life of beauty, of holiness. To so live the life of Christ. The pride of Christ. Ready for the head to be joined or married with Christ. Ready for the rapture. The child with no spot or wrinkle. The, oh God. The mountain, oh God, flow upon the, the church. With the revelations of God. Oh God, that your children will be in your presence 24-7. Walking in your love, walking in your power. 
of glory. Bring it to your presence. Thank for the anointing. Release it upon your, your children, O oh God. As I pray, Father, O oh God, that you the anointing that brings yokes in their life. Free bondage, free oppression, free sickness, free affliction. Release from the Lord. Fire to consume them, to destroy them. Healing. When the strength of Jesus receive your healing, restoration, transmission for heaven. Receive transmission for heaven. Anointing to walk with Jesus day by day, to walk all the way, to finish your race with the race, grace, free, strength, the second grace, anointing, receive that power. The name of God be glorified in your life. In the name of Jesus, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. That is the word of the Lord for you today. In the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Up here. That's the call of God to you. To so you and I. You, the eagles of God, come up to the place where God is. And God's blessings will be upon you eternally. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God.